everybody, and welcome back to another week of Mountain at the Movies. Did you know that when the VCR came out many years ago, video cassette recorder, uh, explain that to a younger person around you if they need it, kind of like the predecessor to the DVD player, when your ability to watch movies in your own home, when that became a reality, a lot of people predicted the demise of movie theaters. They were like, why would anyone pay money to go sit with a bunch of strangers when they can just watch a movie in their own home? We know now that they were very wrong about that, right? Even now with far bigger, better, clearer, easier options for home viewing, the movie theaters are doing great. Why? Partly because I think uh, people just like to get out of the house sometimes, right? Partly because of the big screen and the great sound and the popcorn and all that, but mostly I think because it is a communal experience. Cool things happen when we get together. And I hope that some of what is happening uh, even now, even today, as you've gathered for worship with some other people, I pray that God would add his blessing as we sing and give and pray and listen and learn and worship together. And so specifically today, we're taking a look at another movie and trying to draw out some of the gospel truths contained in it. And that was, that was pretty easy to do with today's movie. It's a great film called Hidden Figures. Maybe you saw it, it was released back in January. It has some great music, some really great acting, and it also carries on a hallowed Hollywood tradition of having at least one person, in this case, Kirsten Dunst, and bless her heart, who tries valiantly but fails miserably at having an authentic Southern accent. Uh, it's set in 1961 in Virginia, and it centers around the stories of three African-American women, Mary Jackson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Katherine Goebel, who then becomes Katherine Johnson, who work for NASA at a time when being women and when being black caused them to face some serious uphill battles in order to be seen and treated as equals in society in general, in the workplace more specifically, and even more specifically in the STEM fields, science and technology and engineering and mathematics. Now sadly, we could talk about how this is still true, even in our world today. But we also, I think, need to celebrate how far we have come, in large part thanks to heroes like these three ladies. The movie is based on, tr on true stories, Mary, Dorothy, and Catherine are real women, and by all accounts, it sticks very close to the true events of history. So if I were to summarize the plot just a little bit, and spoiler alert, although not only has the movie been out for several months, but you've also had since the 1960s to like know what actually happened, so no complaining allowed on that. But the USA was in a space race with Russia, and it was extremely intense. There was this feeling that the safety and the future of the world were hanging in the balance and that gaining the upper hand in space was vitally important for all people. So early on, the Russians seemed to be winning. Uh, maybe they were winning, being the first uh, to successfully send a man to outer space and back again. There was a sense of great urgency about the mission and it was an all hands on deck kind of situation. Even then, many people uh, would have still taken people like brilliant people like Mary and Dorothy and Catherine and shut them out because of their gender and or because of their skin color. But thankfully, there were some doors beginning to be open to them and they had the courage to walk through those doors. Even on the inside though, even while they were able to work at NASA, they still fought a, an uphill battle. Mary, she worked in engineering. Dorothy was a supervisor and just a very natural leader of people and later taught herself to become a programmer as human computers were replaced by machines. And then Catherine, who is sort of the main character in the movie, she was just a genius at applied mathematics. And as the space race heated up, she was invited to join the special space task group of engineers and, and other mathematicians right at the center of the action. So she gets to join this team, and upon entering the room for the first time, she's immediately mistaken for the janitor and asked to take out the trash. Then soon after that, she goes for a cup of coffee, and she's just focused on her work. Looking down at her paper, she fails to notice this looks of just shock around the room as she drinks from the coffee pot. And later, the next morning, she comes back and finds a separate pot labeled colored. She's given huge amounts of numbers to check, but with much of the information redacted or blacked out with a marker. 
And then when she needs to go to the restroom, basic human need, right? She realizes that the only restroom that a colored woman is allowed to use is way back over in the building she used to work in, half a mile away. So a couple times a day, taking a stack of her work with her, she makes the trek. She jogs there in her you know, business clothes. She's, she's wasting precious time that she could be doing this very urgent work she got before her. And then often she also gets soaked by the rain and things like that. So in the scene we're about to see, uh, just picks up the story after Catherine has been doing this for who knows how many weeks or how many months with an ever increasing workload and all this pressure. And she's just finally, she's just had enough. So that's some powerful stuff. I mean, that's your Oscar speech, your Oscar scene right there, right? It's powerful though, because it reflects a deep and a holy truth. If you've been around Mountain at all, you have heard this text from the Bible, and here it is again. Galatians chapter three, verses 26 through 28 says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jew and Gentile, or sometimes it says Jew and Greek, that's race, that's ethnicity, right? Slave or free, that's class, that's socioeconomic status. Male or female, that's gender. Not that those things no longer exist. That's not what's being said here. That's absurd. Clearly those differences exist, but the point is that ultimately in Christ, they do not matter. They should not separate us. We are called to be one and we're called to be unified in the task before us. This was important for the people of NASA in the 1960s to realize as they sought to accomplish their mission. And, and how much more important is it for the people of God to realize when faced with our even more important mission of making disciples more and better disciples of Jesus and helping to build his kingdom and bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, at Mountain Christian Church and wherever else it is that Jesus is recognized as Lord and Savior, guess what? We all pee the same color. You can say amen if you want. There's your tweet uh, for the day. So. Here's a question for all of us to kind of think about. Who don't you see? Who has become invisible to you because of bias and prejudice? The movie is called Hidden Figures for a reason. It's sort of a play on words in multiple ways. And if you're thinking, okay, good question, and I don't know. I mean, how am I supposed to know? They're invisible. How can I identify my own blind spots? Well, the answer is definitely not by being around people who are mostly just like you. And the answer is definitely not by just continuing to do the same things you've done in the same ways that you've always done them. As a church, as a local church, we are called by our Lord to be what Scott McKnight calls a fellowship of difference. D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T-S. Different people in fellowship, doing life together. This has always been the vision of the church of Jesus. McKnight says, and I agree, that our vision, you know, the vision and understanding that a person has about what church is supposed to be is overwhelmingly shaped by his or her experience in a local church. Looking back at the earliest Christian communities and then all the way up through history today, you know, he suggests that a great analogy uh, for us would be like an awesome salad. There's, in a great salad, there's all kinds of different and diverse ingredients and they're identifiable, but they're, they're mixed and mingled together in amazing ways that just bring out the flavor. And we should resist the easy solution of just drenching everything in ranch dressing. I mean, we might like ranch dressing, we might think it's good, but we're often actually missing out on so much more. We're missing out on great. So speaking of doing things the way that they've just always been done, status quo, there's another great scene I want to show you. Catherine and her brilliant mind have become very important to this team. 
but the time is getting short and the pressure is mounting and there's just a regular uh, high level briefing with all the big decision makers and leaders who happen to be a bunch of white males, right? But she knows she needs to be in that meeting. So one of the head engineers played by Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory kind of uh, represents the majority culture's reluctance to change in this movie. And he just, he tells her she can't come. He says there's no protocol for that. Is there any lamer, wimpier, more soul-sucking statement ever uttered than, well, that's just the way things are? I mean, we're the people of God. We're supposed to be change makers. The word protocol, which has always kind of sounded dangerously close to proctology to me. That was probably too much information, sorry. Um, but it's just not a word that we want to allow to shape how we live and move and breathe as God's representatives in this world. We are called to innovate. We're called to reach out to all people, not just with some kind of a kind of a pie in the sky when we die, golden ticket to heaven spirituality, but with real opportunities to serve and contribute and lead and fully use the gifts that God has placed in each of them here and now. Male, female, black, white, brown, red, yellow, purple, young, old, it doesn't matter, everyone. So here's a couple of questions. One, who do you need to invite to the table? For whom do you need to be the person who says, you know what, get her a chair, get him a chair? Or hearkening back to that earlier scene, where might there be an old sign that you need to tear down, you need to take a crowbar to it, some kind of a barrier that you can use your unique position of influence. And by the way, every one of us has that, whether we feel like a leader or not, whether we have positional power and authority in some organization or not, you have a unique sphere of influence. So a barrier, where's a barrier that you can help remove? Being a part of these kinds of things, removing barriers and helping all people to find their place in God's mission of seeking and saving the lost, this is always gonna be difficult. But so is anything that actually matters. The Christian life was never supposed to be easy or comfortable. That's a challenge for us sometimes because we've just been told all our lives and many of us have become convinced that the goal of life is just to be happy and comfortable. But the Christian life is better than that. It's filled with purpose and meaning, which is actually what our hearts desire at a deeper level. You may think that what you want is to be happy and there's a lot of advertisers that work hard to convince you of that every day, but I say that what you really desire on an even deeper level is to do something that counts with your life, to do something and be a part of something that matters. So with that in mind, check out this next scene where Mary has gone to court to petition a judge to allow her to take part in a class that she has to take in order to achieve her goal of becoming an engineer. All right, first of all, just look at the savvy that Mary shows here. I, I was so impressed. You know, she did her background work. She was well prepared. She even kind of played to his ego a little bit with that question about who wants to be first. But it's the second question, the other question, that was even more powerful. It is such an amazing question for you and for me today as well. Which of the things that you do today is going to matter in 100 years? Focus on that, right, and stop doing anything else. This is this 100-year question is a question that actually changed my whole life. Back in college, I was studying to be an engineer, Go Jackets, and uh, I really enjoyed it, you know? Uh, but at the same time, I was getting involved in this awesome little Christian campus ministry, and I was sensing this call into full-time ministry work. And my pastor and mentor at the time, he used to talk about the 100-year rule, and he would ask that question. What's gonna matter in 100 years? And that was really an important guiding thought for me as I shaped my vocational choices. And now, here I am, preaching to y'all today. But for many of my friends, the answer was go and be an awesome, God-honoring engineer. Be a leader in your company, in your church, in your family. Make a bunch of money to support ministry and mission. 
Make the world a better place with your big old brain. Rock the pocket protector for Jesus, right? For Mary Jackson, her calling was to be an engineer. And thank God for that, right? Thank God she followed that. And by the way, just speaking of thanking God, just as a little bit of an aside, I want to say that I am super thankful to the makers of this film for the way that they allowed the Christian faith of these three ladies to be treated fairly and authentically as a huge and central part of the story. For a long time, I feel like mainstream movies, would they almost all of them would just totally eliminate all signs and symbols and talk of God and Jesus and church and faith. And it would just be so ridiculous sometimes when that was clearly a central part of the story. And they, they would either make the Christian characters into buffoons and simpletons or evil, horrible people, right? Nothing in between. And this still happens a lot. But I just feel like in recent years, there's been kind of a change and a lot of more mainstream movies are no longer afraid to give fair and honest treatment to the place that Christian faith has in many of the characters' lives. And I'm very thankful for that. I really appreciate it, for example, we right after the big dramatic bathroom sign removal scene, it's just a quiet, simple scene where Catherine's family is sitting around the table and they pray. They express gratitude for the food. They ask for continued blessings from God. They express a desire to be a blessing to others. And they say, in Jesus' name. And I just commend the Christian leaders and any other people who have just been honest and open-minded enough to allow authentic and fair expressions of faith to exist in this movie and any others and in, in all their forms of storytelling. Now, back to Mary and the judge. What's going on? What's going, what's going to matter in 100 years? What if you and I were to run our decisions through that filter? How would it affect our lives, our work, our family, our friendships, our involvement in and commitment level to our local church? In my experience, the 100-year question is one of the best questions to help me reconfigure and recalibrate my priority list and just realign my life back toward God's ways. So if you think about it this way, Maybe this would help us. Uh, the movie set in 1961. What if we went back 100 years in the other direction? 1861. Think about that. What was happening in this country? Beginning of the Civil War, right? And we watch hidden figures and we begin to feel some sadness and frustration and anger at the way things were in 1961. But we also need to celebrate, to a degree, the opportunities that these women did have in 1961 that they certainly would not have had in 1861. And we can continue to be frustrated with the ways that progress is still too slow while also continuing to just march forward. If you play it forward, now imagine with me 2061. That's the year that I will, Lord willing, be 82 years old. And my daughters will be 50 and 52. What is the world going to look like then? And who's going to decide that? Well, we are. That begins now with our decisions and how we live. I was reminded the other day of just a, one of those classic great quotes. When is the time, best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the second best time? Today. So I just wanna show you another scene here, which I think I'm willing to say, this has become my favorite scene in the whole movie. Maybe you're thinking, wait, that is your favorite scene? I mean, wow, Nathan, you really are a nerd. Well, here's why I love it. I love it first because the answer to the newest of new kinds of problems in this, in this scene is actually found in something ancient. They actually say, that's ancient, but it works. Reminds me a lot of the Bible. And also, I love that scene because it is the key moment. It is the key breakthrough and it's just so anticlimactic. It's like the opposite of the big dramatic Oscar scene. It's just so simple and plain, and yet it is the moment of victory. It's just this team working together, and it's these three people working late, absolutely dedicated to the mission, persisting and persevering, and keeping on, keeping on, and then it happens, right? When I first saw this movie, even as I began preparing the sermon, I was thinking, you know, this is primarily about the gender stuff, the race stuff, inclusion, all the things we've been talking about, and it is. 
In Christ, we set aside focusing on our differences and instead, as we focus on Him, our differences become part of our strength and our beauty. There's unity and diversity and it's a glimpse of God's kingdom. And it's all so true and all so central to this story and to God's bigger story. But also, the more I got into the story and let it get into me, the more I became convinced that it is, it's also just as much about this other thing. And that thought is this, persist, persist. As much as this film has caused me to continue to reflect on Galatians chapter three, you know, there is no Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free, no male nor female. It has also caused me to reflect on Romans chapter five, which just says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know, listen to this, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. You know, based on everything I've learned in this movie and the things that I've read, that progression is such an accurate description of Mary Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn and Katherine Goble Johnson. And it goes on to say this, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The mission into which you and I have been called, it's bigger than NASA, it's bigger than America, it's the very mission of Almighty God in this world. It is so important and it is often really hard work that we have to do and it comes with some suffering. But praise God that in Christ, because of the cross and the empty tomb, we can know that our suffering can produce in us perseverance and that over time that perseverance turns into character and that out of godly character flows hope and Christ-centered hope does not disappoint us or let us down or put us to shame. That is what this story is about at the deepest level. Trust God. Hold on to hope. Stay the course do the next right thing in Jesus' name. Whenever and wherever God has placed you in the world and in the story, do your part to help move the mission forward. Sometimes, maybe you'll have your Oscar scene, but far more often, it'll be behind the scenes and under the radar. The moments of breakthrough for us as we move forward as a church, as we move forward in our families, and they happen in long meetings, they happen around dinner tables and at coffee shops, they happen whenever and wherever God's people persist in doing his good work and then he gives the moments of victory. One final comment, one of my other favorite things that's done in recent years in movies based on true stories is at the very end when they show the cast members alongside the actual real historical figures that they're portraying. You know, it would be like, kind of like, let's say they were to make a movie about Mountain, and let's say the lead pastor were to be played by this guy, for example, All right? Tom Cruise, okay? But then at the end, they would show you a photo of the real life lead pastor that he was portraying, and it would just be this guy. Yeah, I mean, it can be a little disappointing, I guess, uh, although they are the same height. But seriously, whenever they do this at the end of movies, uh, I'm never disappointed. It, it actually gets me all emotional. Like, I tear up almost every single time. For one, I'm just moved and impressed by the artistry of it, by the casting and the costumes and the period things that they do and the acting, and it's just amazing. But even more than that, it just hits me in the heart like, Oh, wow, that is the actual person. These are the real people who lived this story. And it just reminds me that when it comes to God's mission, he has given it to and he is counting on you and me, just us, not the pretty people, not the stars. Kevin Costner and Taraji P. Henson and Janelle Monet ain't walking through that door. In this place and in this time, the great mission of God has been entrusted into our hands. So to borrow the words 
from Mary Oliver's great poem, tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life?